Hello and welcome to the launch of the report The Cocaine Pipeline to Europe. I'm Virginia Comolli from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and I will be your moderator today. For those of you who are not familiar with the Global Initiative, we are a civil society organization studying organized crime and responses to it. We rely on an international network of experts and produce analyses, convene meetings and events with experts and law enforcement and other practitioners, but we also build resilience by supporting those in the countries most affected by the negative impact of organized crime. We are very happy to partner with Inside Crime on the project leading to the production of the report we are launching today, which is the result of over two years of investigations carried out across multiple countries. Inside Crime is a not-for-profit not think tank and media organization dedicated to the study of organized crime in Latin America and the Caribbean. It fuses investigative journalism with academic rigor, building its analysis from ground research and speaking to all actors, legal and illegal. In addition to its published work, it provides studies and policy recommendations for governments from its offices in Medellin, Colombia and Washington, D.C. This webinar gives us the opportunity to hear from the authors as well as other experts and get a good sense of how trends in cocaine trafficking from Latin America to Europe have evolved and their implications. The past few years have seen a rise in production in cocaine in Latin America, which has translated in an unprecedented growth in narcotics trade. Whereas discussions uh, tend to be had through the prism of the United States, how it has, how the trade has impacted the US and what responses usually within the context of the war on drugs have been employed, evidence suggests that Europe is a far more attractive market for cocaine traffickers. Today's discussion is the chance to unpack how this came to be and also to address the effects on the European market and European criminal organizations, such as the strengthening of mafia groups in the Balkans. Also to note is, to, is how growing cocaine trafficking into Europe is affecting other transit regions, such as West Africa, where seizures have increased substantially over the course of the, couple, of the past couple of years. Levels of trafficking uh, through the region have ebbed and flowed since the 90s, but it looks like the trade through West Africa is currently experiencing a resurgence. And this will be the subject of a future study we'll publish with our partners at ENACT. Before I turn to our speakers, just a couple of practical points. The event is scheduled to last 90 minutes in total, and following the presentation, we'll have time for questions and comments from the audience. So please do use the chat function on Zoom and submit your questions in either English or Spanish, and we'll do our very best to address as many, as many questions as possible in the latter part of the event. So the event is also being recorded and you will be able uh, to, to watch it on the Global Initiative YouTube channel very shortly. So now I would like to turn to the lead author of the report, Jeremy McDermott, who is also the co-founder and executive director of Inside Crime to share the key findings of the report. So Jeremy, over to you. Many thanks, Virginia. Um, I'm joined by uh, Inside Crime's um, James Bargent, who was um, the lead investigator uh, with me on this uh, on this investigation into the cocaine pipeline to Europe. He'll be answering some questions a bit later on. I'm now going to share my screen with you so we can um, have a little presentation. Okay. In Latin America, at least, perceptions of the cocaine trade, as Virginia mentioned, center around the US war on drugs and today the Mexican cartels. This uh, is indeed uh, a story of the cocaine trade moving north into the single biggest market in the world, the United States. However, in Colombia, where Insight Crime is based, um, we've seen a shift in this narrative. Sure, we see Mexican cartels desperate to secure enough cocaine to feed their supply lines, sending buyers down to Colombia and seeking to support any criminal players there who will feed them this criminal commodity. This isn't for us a sign of strength, but rather one of weakness on the part of the Mexican cartels. They can't get enough serious Colombian suppliers to feed them. Um, so 
many of the more sophisticated criminal players are not interested in the US market. US authorities spend billions of dollars a year on interdiction, extradition of drug traffickers, and on the seizure of ill-gotten gains. What this immense uh, expenditure has done is to make drug trafficking into the US more risky. Added to this is the fact a kilo of cocaine fetches around $28,000 wholesale in the US, a much lower price than other developed nations, thanks mainly to its geographic proximity um, to the main producing cocaine producing nations of Colombia, Peru and Bolivia. So for the sophisticated criminal businessman, it makes no sense to take more risks for less reward. Why risk greater interdiction, extradition and seizure of assets to move a kilo of cocaine into the US when that same kilo in Europe fetches around $40,000 with much less risk. And Latin traffickers, especially the Colombians, can't move their product fast enough. Production and therefore supply is booming. The story of cocaine to Europe isn't focused um, in Central America and Mexico like that of the US market. This is a story of South America. And one of the main challenges for traffickers targeting Europe is getting across the Atlantic. Unlike with the US market, there's no land bridge, so they are restricted to maritime or air transport. And the favorite far and away is container shipping. And the traffickers are spoiled for choice, both in departure points and in Europe in the reception ports. The growing preference for Europe spelt out to us initially by underground sources is confirmed by the seizure data, which shows record numbers. You may have heard of the seizure of 23 tonnes of cocaine over the last few weeks, including 16 tonnes in Hamburg, uh, the biggest ever European seizure, which came via Paraguay, not a well-known departure point or contamination point. But you can be sure that someone didn't wake up one morning and say, let's put 16 tons of cocaine into a few containers traveling from Paraguay to Germany. This was likely a long developed and tested route. The Dutch police believe that in 2019, up to 500 tons of cocaine passed just through the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp. The scale of the trade is the highest on record. European authorities, especially the Dutch and Belgians who are working together, have become much better at interdiction. But the seizure numbers reflect growing volume, not just better interdiction. And there's a simple reason for that. If traffickers start losing more than 20 to 25% uh, of their loads, they just switch routes. It's simple business sense. The use of containers has sparked an endless game of hide and seek. In the early days, um, the drugs were simply hidden amongst legal produce, particularly fruit um, coming from Colombia, uh, Peru uh, and other uh, producer nations. But European authorities now pay particular attention to fruit containers and the companies that supply the fruit and the ports from which they're embarked. So traffickers started using not just the cargo, but the containers themselves. Um, and the refrigerated containers in particular um, offer multiple hiding places for the traffickers. A more recent development which bypasses intelligence efforts to profile particular shipping companies uh, or specific cargoes uh, or known contamination points is the rip-on, rip-off system. Here, containers which have already been inspected and sealed by customs are contaminated. The traffickers have copies of the customs seals. They throw the drugs into a container they know is bound for Europe and reseal the container with a custom seal. Then once the container has arrived in Europe, the drugs are ripped off. 
Another seal is often put on again so that the owner of the container and the cargo within has no idea that cocaine has piggybacked off his delivery. Another variant um, uh, on this um, aimed at avoiding growing security procedures at departure ports is the drop-off method. This is where a vessel will pull up alongside a container ship and pass the drugs on board. Um, obviously, much of the crew needs to be in on this for, for this method to succeed. Um, but we've seen increasing cases of this, for example, off the coast of Venezuela, um, where drugs can cross um, without resistance from Colombia, then be put on, on go fast boats or fishing boats or trawlers and rendezvous with bigger cargo or container ships on the high seas. A huge amount of effort is now being dedicated to the monitoring of container shipping in Europe and elsewhere. And there's talk of a new generation of smart containers that will be continually monitored and therefore harder to contaminate. However, again, if that seizure rate hits 25%, then the traffickers will switch modus operandi or routes and indeed some already have. The use of drug submarines or semi-submersibles has long been a feature of drug trafficking in the Americas. In 2019, for example, 35 such vessels were seized. Who knows how many completed their journey successfully? It's bound to be in the hundreds. Each of these vessels carries between two and eight tons of cocaine, and they usually sunk once the drugs have been offloaded. Now, there had long been rumors that such vessels were capable of crossing the Atlantic. And this was proven in November 2019 when a narco sub was discovered off the coast of Spain with a cargo of three tons of cocaine. Um, we have found drug subs being seized now uh, in, in uh, Suriname, for example, on the uh, on the east coast uh, of, um, of South America. Um, so these submarines are not just leaving Colombia, which has been the home uh, of their development and evolution. The technology and the ability to build these kind of vessels has now been exported. Um, and we fear that there are several different departure points in places like Brazil, Suriname, Guyana, and Venezuela, where these semi-submersibles can begin their journey across the Atlantic. As well as the semi-submersibles, we believe that pleasure crafts such as yachts are also being used more and more to move loads of cocaine. Traffic's also used. There are well-established routes for drug planes crossing to West Africa, for example. Illegal flights can take off from places like Venezuela, largely without being bothered, so long as the right people are paid off. We've also seen charter flights laden with drugs flying directly into the, into the UK. Commercial, liners have long been, commercial airliners have long been used by teams of mules swallowing cocaine capsules. Usually, this is um, a small volume trade um, maybe a couple of kilos being moved on each flight. But then if that's being done at, you know, three times a week, then a serious amount of weight is being smuggled. And there have been some cases of sophisticated mule operations putting up to 30 people, 30 mules onto a single flight. One case shown in this slide that shows the extent and importance of corruption is that of an Air France flight in 2013 from Caracas, Venezuela to Paris, which saw 1.4 tons of cocaine uh, in suitcases loaded by Venezuelan National Guardsmen onto this standard passenger flight. I want to use this um, case also to take us to the criminal actors who are running the cocaine trade to Europe. As you'll see here, um, we've got uh, senior Venezuelan officials uh, involved um, in what is uh, loosely termed the Cartel of the Sons, which is state-embedded criminal structures in the regime of Nicolas Maduro, 
the current president of Venezuela. The supplier of these drugs um, were their allies, um, the Colombian rebel group, the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. What you will also see are British brokers, uh, the middlemen putting together these deals um, to Europe, working with French, Italian and Dutch um, criminal and mafia organizations. We need to understand that the networks running cocaine into Europe today are not just Colombian or Italian. Yes, there are Colombian brokers and dealers and cells in Europe, often based out of Spain for linguistic and cultural reasons. And, and there's been no shortage of arrests there, as, as this slide shows. Uh, and yes, there was an infamous connect between Salvatore Mancuso of the paramilitary army of the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, or AUC, who had a direct relation with the Intel Italian Endrangheta, which was um, at one point the Endrangheta were the main uh, wholesale suppliers of cocaine to the whole of Europe. And indeed, this cocaine connect was one of the reasons, along with the development of the port of, um, of Gioia Tauro, for the explosive growth of this faction of the Italian mafia. But today, we need to put aside the notions of uh, single criminal groups running all the links uh, in the chain of cocaine to Europe. Those days are gone. Um, when there are cocaine arrests, there tends to be many different nationalities in the room. The Spanish submarine, for example, had an Ecuadorian crew and a Galician skipper. Um, the arrest that we've seen in Europe at drug handover points usually see at least three nationalities there, a Latin American, often a Colombia, a supplier, a representative of the buyers, often a European mafia group, Italian, British, Serbian or Albanian among them, and then the broker, who is often Latin American, Spanish or Dutch. And so we need to understand the nature of these networks, these multinational, multi-ethnic networks um, that are now responsible for smuggling the vast majority of cocaine into Europe. The different nodes within the criminal networks, reception teams, the money launderers, distributors, transporters, transporters are almost always made up of different nationalities and different structures. This is, of course, why it's so hard today to dismantle these networks. They're like uh, ever-changing constellations. They'll, they'll align for a series of shipments, then break apart to form different constellations around different routes or consignments, depending on the sellers, brokers, transporters, or buyers. What I want to do um, to, to finish up is, uh, is to gaze a little bit into the crystal ball um, and have a look at what we think um, might happen uh, in the future for the cocaine trade to Europe. The first thing is that the production of cocaine already at record levels um, will remain steady or perhaps even grow. Um, while the Colombian president, uh, Ivan Duque, has made cocaine eradication the center of his security policy, um, we haven't yet seen in, in figures yet, and we're still waiting for, for the 2020 numbers to come out, we still haven't seen a drop in production. Um, the other two nations, uh, principal uh, coca growing and cocaine producing nations um, of Peru and uh, Bolivia have also seen increases um, over recent years. Uh, and there have been some disturbing indications that coca is being grown in other countries. Um, and Inside Crime is currently looking into um, some places in Central America, uh, Venezuela and Ecuador. The second thing, political chaos throughout much of Latin America. This uh, is, a, is a, a facet and staple of life uh, in the region. 
Uh, and looking, for example, at Peru and Bolivia, they've undergone significant political chaos over the last couple of years. And this has really hit counter-narcotics efforts. Um, look at the collapse of Venezuela. This is just another example of, of the endless opportunities that political chaos and corruption provide for, for drug traffickers. We see a continuing expansion of the European drug market and consumption, particularly for Eastern Europe. And this is something I think Laurent is going to pick up uh, in his presentation in a few minutes. The increasingly sophisticated game of hide and seek and container trafficking. Uh, there has certainly been a significant improvement in, um, in interdiction in certain ports in Europe. Um, Rotterdam and, and Antwerp foremost amongst them. Um, we believe that containers are going to remain um, uh, the favourite uh, way to move drugs. Uh, what we do believe and what we are seeing is a change in the ports, a change in the departure ports or the contamination uh, points in Latin America, in the Caribbean and other transit nations and within the reception um, points. Um, and so this game of, of, of cat and mouse or hide and seek um, is going to shift around Europe. Um, uh, and this will bring with it different challenges to different European nations as organized crime um, criminal networks focus on what they identify as the more vulnerable points of entry into Europe. The development of different smuggling methods, this is an ongoing um, an ongoing battle. The, the drug trafficking organizations have shown themselves to be immensely uh, agile and creative uh, in the way they can hide um, drugs, not only within um, cargoes in, uh, in their powder form, but there have been uh, examples of tons of cocaine being diluted into liquids, um, being sprayed onto clothes. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that they are able to camouflage and disguise the drugs um, in legitimate cargoes. We also see an increasing presence of European mafias upstream in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, um, as you'll see in our report, the Italians have been around for a long time uh, and been brokering multi-ton um, shipments for, for, for almost decades. We're seeing the Serbs and Albanians uh, increasingly move upstream. Um, and it's hard to underestimate the roles that the Dutch play uh, in brokering major cocaine deals as well. So with the, the Europeans moving upstream with an increase in consumption and trafficking into and via Europe, we think that there is going to be an inevitable strengthening of European drug trafficking organizations. Um, We've also seen, uh, particularly under COVID restrictions, the increasing use of encryption technology to broker deals as the preferred face-to-face -face meetings hasn't been possible due to the travel restrictions. We think this is likely to continue and this obviously facilitates um, the secrecy um, and the sealing of deals on the dark web um, or through this specialized um, encryption technology. Violence. Um, where Latin America is one of the most, is the most violent um, region in the world. Um, this is uh, in no small part drug fueled. Um, we're especially visible in Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil and Paraguay out of the South American nations we've been talking about. But we feel that Europe's not going to escape violence altogether. Um, and we do think there'll be an increase in drug related violence as the market increases and as there is more competition uh, over entry points, uh, internal corridors in Europe and distribution, although we'll obviously be at much lower levels than, than within Latin America. The rise of the invisibles. The invisibles are a, um, a generation of drug, very sophisticated drug traffickers um, they look like high level businessmen. They pass all but the most detailed scrutiny. 
These guys aren't wearing their crocodile boots, Stetson hats and gold chains favoured by their Mexican cousins. They'll be dressed in Armani or Savile Row. They may have advanced degrees and they have extensive legal business interests which camouflage their illegal activity. And then finally, a final prediction is that once vaccinations have taken effect um, across Europe and things open up again, we expect a very big party and a very big jump, perhaps temporary, but perhaps not, in cocaine consumption. Thanks very much. I'm going to pass you back now to Virginia. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure uh, your remarks have already generated multiple uh, comments and questions. I was particularly taken by your description of the different methods employed by the traffickers, but also by the increasing internationalization of, of the business and, and the roles that different nationalities, and different groups uh, play along, along the supply chain. And this leads us quite nicely into the, uh, into the next presentation. And in fact, I'd like to invite my colleague Fationa Meididi, who is the field network coordinator for the Western, Western Balkans at the Global Initiative, uh, to take the floor and really reflect on, on the trends that Jeremy has just uh, highlighted and just describe how they are impacting the activities of crime groups in the Balkans and also their uh, ability to reach into the rest of, of Europe. Uh, Fationa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, the Balkan region, which lies at the heart of Southeastern Europe, has historically been an important transit route for drugs, especially for heroin coming from the East and being trafficked in Europe. The long experience in heroin trafficking, together with other illicit activities going on in the region in the last three decades, like cigarette smuggling, human and armed trafficking, and cannabis cultivation, has given local criminal groups experience as well financial strength. We should not forget that trafficking and illegal activities in this region has been often accelerated by its troubled past, including ethnic wars, creation of the new states, and widespread corruption. This has often given criminals important links with people in power, and in many cases, political support. One other advantage is the fact that criminal groups in the region don't act based on ethnic lines but strongly collaborate with each other whenever this is profitable. So as a result, in the last two decades, criminal groups from the Balkan have also entered the lucrative business of cocaine trading. The start was humbling. Criminals from the Balkans were randomly contracted from the Italian mafia and other criminal networks to drive cocaine from ports throughout the continent and distribute it in the streets of European capitals. But soon they started to master the skills and learn the tricks, moving up the value chain to become major distribution by securing cocaine from the source in Latin America, unloading it in the Balkans and some of the major ports of the Western Europe and creating networks for its distribution throughout the continent and beyond. Firstly, I want to speak about the current routes and ways of transportation of cocaine in the Balkans and the grip that criminal groups from six Western Balkan countries, namely Albania, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia and Bosnia, had. Criminal groups from these countries bring cocaine to the ports of the Adriatic Sea, such as Dures in Albania and Bar in Montenegro. The favorite means of transportation is through containers of foods and goods that enter the region from Latin America. For example, in 2014, in the Montenegrin port of Bar, 250 kilograms of cocaine were seized beneath a shipment of bananas coming from Ecuador. In 2018, more than one, uh, 600 kilos of cocaine hidden in another container of bananas, this time coming from Colombia, were seized in the uh, Albanian port of Dures. This record bust for these two countries have raised the alarm over the risk of criminal groups using these ports to ship large amounts of cocaine through the back door of Europe. So, a region notorious for trafficking of cannabis and heroin, suddenly contention for cocaine. But criminal groups from the region are not limiting themselves to bringing cocaine via Adriatic. They are using Greek ports as well as those in the Black Sea. 
In 2019, Romanian authorities seized 1.7 tons of cocaine stashed on the boat that capsized in the Danube Delta in the Black Sea. Investigations showed that the shipment belonged to criminal groups in Serbia. In another case, law enforcement agencies have seized large amounts of cocaine in a container coming into the Greek port uh, and linked this seizure with the criminal groups uh, from the Western Balkans. So in February 2020, the authorities in the Dutch Caribbean island of Aruba seized five uh, tons of cocaine on the board of a cargo ship destined to arrive in the Thessaloniki port in Greece and arrested several Montenegrin crew members for drug trafficking. It is very important to note that only a small percentage of cocaine entering the, the Western Balkan regions really stays in this region. As with heroin, the, the, the Balkans is a transit route for cocaine, destined for bigger and more lucrative markets. The total population of the six Western Balkan countries doesn't exceed 18 million. So, and, and this is considered a, a small market on top of being one of the poorest regions of Europe. However, in the last years, the, the local consumption and the capacity to buy these expensive drugs in the region has increased, together with the reputation of, of the Balkans as an interesting holiday destination. These elements are expected to bring in the near future a bigger local, local consumption and more drugs staying, in fact, in the region. Our research conducted in the last few months has found out that the wholesale prices for a kilogram of cocaine in Western Balkans range from 32 to 50,000 euros, uh, comparable with countries like Germany and Italy, but lower than the whole price, uh, uh, wholesale prices in countries like Spain, Belgium and France. This is an indicator that that uh, that shows that still the reason the, the the region doesn't get the uh, the same large amount of the drug as some of the hotspot countries in Western Europe. But this doesn't mean that the criminal groups from the Western Balkans are out of this market. In fact, the opposite is true. As criminal networks have an important foothold in the Western European ports. The ability of criminal groups from the Western Balkans to be part of this important playground is without any doubt the result of a strong ties that they have created in the last two decades with cartels in Latin America. Mimicking the Italian model, uh, mafia model, these groups have moved upstream toward the source, having now their brokers in the countries where the cocaine, cocaine is produced, like Colombia, and in important dispatching centers like Ecuador. Uh, different accounts show that these groups usually work with the so-called 50% modality, meaning that cartels in Latin America, for each load they sell to the Balkan groups, add another equal amount to their account, which on arrival is entrusted to criminals to be distributed on their behalf. Accounts show that this business model have, secure, have secured them millions of euros in revenue, money that are laundered you, uh, usually in the Western Balkan, but also in the countries that they operate. As a result, Latin America has turned into an El Dorado, where groups from the Balkans believe they could find their fortune. Their presence in the area is well documented by a large number of arrests of people, uh, but also uh, by a large number of killings from people of, of people from the Balkans. At least 10 people from Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia and Kosovo have been killed in the last five years in Colombia and Ecuador for what is believed to be uh, cocaine disputes. 24 people from the Western Balkans have arrested in Latin America on drug-related offenses in the last six years. Ecuadorian police estimates that between 2017 and 2019, 56 Albanians entered this country for cocaine trafficking purposes. Criminal groups from the Western Balkans bring large amounts of cocaine to the major Western European ports, like those in Spain, Belgium, Netherlands and Germany. Later on, the cocaine is distributed in other European markets, uh, 
countries and beyond. In 2019, the Spanish police seized 700 kilograms of cocaine and arrested uh, two Macedonian citizens. In fact, one of the bloodiest conflicts in the region among criminal groups has its origin in Spain. In 2014, the, dis uh, the disappearance of 200 kilograms of cocaine in Valencia split an important Montenegrin criminal group and started a, a violent war between its members. So far, more than 50 people have been killed over this conflict in Serbia, Montenegro, but also abroad in Austria and Greece. These operations abroad are held by the large networks of distribution that Balkan groups have created, not only in Spain, but also in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, etc. Creating and running the whole chain, from arranging big shipments directly from Latin America to street distribution throughout Europe, have empowered and raised the prominence of these groups. Uh, this is illustrated, in fact, in an operation that Europol conducted in September 2020 that resulted in the takedown of the Albanian-speaking Compania Bello criminal group, labelled one of the most active in Europe. According to Europol, an Albanian broker was networking to distribute large quantities of cocaine from Latin America. It is interesting that the broker is locked in a prison cell in Ecuador, but this didn't stop him from coordinating the whole network. The group was able to move the cocaine and distribute it in 10 countries. They were using encrypted technology to communicate, as well as an underground re remittances system of uh, Chinese origin to transfer the money. All these elements uh, put an emphasis on the significance of the criminal networks from the Western Balkans and their ability to be important players in the international stage of cocaine trafficking. To summarize, in the past decades, cocaine was coming to the Balkans, but more significantly, criminal groups from this region have entered the cocaine market in Western Europe and have quickly moved up the value chain to become major players. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. <laughs> so much, uh, Fationa. Uh, thank you for sharing the findings of your own research. And it seems to me some of the, the, uh, the, the most recent evidence that you've highlighted with regards to the violence within and among these groups seems to confirm uh, what Jeremy was also predicting as, a traje as the trajectory going forward. So this increase of violence attached to this uh, growth in the uh, cocaine trafficking uh, in Europe. Uh, so now I would like to uh, turn to our uh, final uh, speaker, Laurent Lanier, who is a principal scientific analyst uh, of drug markets at the European Monitoring Centre for Drug and Drug Addiction, to share with us the latest picture on the European market for cocaine using data collected by the EMCDDA. Laurent, the floor is yours. Thank you, Virginia. I'm going to try and share my screen. I hope it works. Um, I hope everyone can see my presentation. They do. Fine. So, cocaine markets in Europe. Um, well, first of all, a few words about the EMCDA. I'm not sure all the audience uh, knows what it is. We are a decentralized EU ag agency. We're an official agency. We've been uh, monitoring drugs in Europe for about 25 years out of Lisbon, Portugal. Um, and we are the EU's reference point on drugs. We work with a network of 27 uh, focal points, plus one in Norway and one in Turkey, in all over uh, the EU, which every year send us a lot of statistical and other information about uh, drugs in Europe, including uh, drug use and drug trafficking and production. Um, let me share with you what the key issues on cocaine were on our latest drug markets report, which we published in 2019 uh, with Europol. Some of them may sound familiar, uh, high availability and record production, uh, more and uh, newer OCGs, organized criminal groups involved in Europe in Latin America. Uh, on top of the Balkan ones, of course, there are also Western European ones, such as Irish gangs, French, etc. 
Uh, I just skip over the containers, obviously. And perhaps uh, one of the most uh, worrying points is the fueling of corruption and violence in Europe, which we are already uh, seeing the signs of uh, corruption, obviously, of some criminal justice um, uh, personnel, but also in the professions, in particularly in ports and airports, and perhaps soon in other uh, walks of life. And as for violence, yes, there has been cases, document, documented cases of cocaine-related violence. Um, so what is, the, uh, Europe, what is the cocaine market in Europe? Well, nowadays it has become the second largest drug market in Europe. You can see it here. These are estimates that the MCVA has uh, worked out on the size of the retail market. So in this is the retail market, uh, which in 2017, the most recent estimate, was estimated at about 119 tonnes uh, and worth 9.1 billion euro. Uh, that was more, um, almost twice the value um, estimated four years previously and 20, 30 odd tons more uh, per year consumed by consumers at retail level. Uh, what does the uh, supply side data look like? So you saw Jeremy's graph earlier, which stopped in 2017 for the quantity of uh, cocaine seized here on the bottom left of the page. Well, in 2018, we broke the 2017 record, and I can tell you that in 2019, we broke uh, the 2018 record, and I can even tell you that in 2020, we also broke the 2019 record. Um, that's true for the quantity seized and the number of seizures, which I will come back to. I would like to uh, call your attention on this uh, exercise that we do of monitoring the purity of cocaine that... Uh, drug users bring to drug checking services in Europe and our latest data on January to June 2019 shows that more than half of the cocaine available to consumers, so we're not talking about wholesale shipments, but cocaine available to consumers in a number of European countries um, contain only cocaine and things like starch or non-active uh, substances, which shows that cocaine purity uh, indeed has increased and there is less adulterant such, uh, or dangerous adulterant such as levamisole used in, in the cocaine sold to consumers in Europe. As you can see, the increase in purity has been quite dramatic from 100 in 2008, eight, sorry, to uh, 144 in 2018. That means a 44 percent increase in cocaine purity across Europe. Um, so yes, the market in Europe is still in Western Europe. Uh, but it's gaining ground elsewhere. As you can see on the slide, which shows, uh, the map shows the number of seizures. So the number of seizures is an indicator of the penetration of a drug um, on the market because the vast majority of the seizures are of small quantities of one gram. They're seized from small dealers or users, while they, uh, the quantity seized tend to be a reflection of a few very large seizures, such as the one uh, in Hamburg and Antwerp that we mentioned uh, that were mentioned previously. Um, so yes, Western Europe is indeed uh, the place uh, for now, but as you can see, uh, it's gaining ground elsewhere, including Turkey, a country of uh, one million odd inhabitants, which is uh, quite a sizable market, uh, which is only now uh, in the light blue here, but in the future, who knows? So another way of looking at the market is to count the number of users. So we estimate that 4.3 million uh, adults, so people between the ages of 15, uh, yes, 15 and 64, have used cocaine in the past year. So that's your current uh, market. Note that cocaine is the drug for which the, the using population is older uh, compared to other stimulants, such as amphetamine and methamphetamine, and especially MDMA. So we're talking about a population of people who are older, who tend to have a little bit more money than the others, who may also be more at risk of health uh, problems by using cocaine. Uh, in their, indeed, deaths with cocaine are increasing in Europe. In several countries, report an increase. 75,000 people entered treatment for cocaine-related problems in Europe in 2018. Um, and uh, again, I attract your attention that although the vast majority of people sniff cocaine, snort cocaine, or insufflate cocaine in their noses, 
quite a significant proportion, about a quarter, uh, smoke the drug. Um, and to smoke the drug, you have to smoke base. Uh, you can't smoke the uh, cocaine powder. It has to be in base form. I'll come back to this later. Another indicator of the prevalence of cocaine, especially in the west of Europe, is uh, given here um, by the emergency presentations of people um, in uh, 27 Sentinel hospitals that we are monitoring uh, across Europe. So you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, cocaine in the blue, which is really uh, prevalent in uh, uh, Western Europe, with some exceptions. Slovenia there um, is also uh, quite, uh, has more cocaine than amphetamine, for example. But by and large, it's Western Europe. If you look on the other side of the slide, you have uh, cocaine metabolites found in wastewater in selected uh, European cities. And again, you can see that the largest dots are located in Western Europe, but that they all, there are also dots in Eastern Europe. Will they grow bigger in the future? Jeremy tells us yes. We will see uh, whether he's right, but I'm afraid he's right. Uh, <laughs> cocaine production and trafficking in Europe. Well, one of the other things that has happened to the European cocaine market is that some production uh, at least some chemical transformation uh, linked to cocaine is taking place in Europe. Most of it uh, is what we call secondary extraction. So that's when cocaine is trafficked in other materials, such as mixed within plastics or within clothes or inside liquids. And you need to perform uh, some chemical process to extract the cocaine out of this carrier material. Um, however, we fear that... Uh, due to a, a variety of reasons, uh, including seizure of precursors uh, and some rumors uh, that some cocaine base or some cocaine paste is imported as such from South America. I know that Jeremy would be interested in that and may be transformed into cocaine uh, hydrochloride, so the cocaine powder that people sniff within Europe. Um, there's very little evidence of that, but um, it is, uh, it is probably something that we're going to see uh, in future. Uh, again, the importation of base in Europe, may uh, cocaine base, may make uh, a drug available to cocaine smokers, which wasn't available before. Uh, and therefore, we, if this is uh, becoming a modus operandi of the traffickers to import base into Europe in order to transform it into powder hydrochloride here in Europe, um, where well, we may see uh, some spillover on the market of people who smoke cocaine products. We also highlight the key roles of brokers. Um, the partnerships are highly dynamic, so the broker puts people together for a number uh, uh, of months, and then once the business is done, they just disband. Um, and again, the map on the, uh, the right-hand side uh, confirms once more that um, the, the cocaine market and the, and the wholesale market and trafficking of cocaine takes place really uh, mostly for now in Western Europe. Um, we mentioned wholesale prices in Europe um, earlier. Uh, um, Inside Prime mentioned them in, in their presentation. Uh, this is something that is available on the uh, EMCDA website. You can go there, it's public. And we have a number of wholesale prices uh, for a number of countries that report these to us. Um, and to make it short, uh, I think uh, Jeremy mentioned that the average price for cocaine was 40,000 euros. Well, in fact, uh, there is no such thing as an average price for cocaine. You know, it depends where you buy cocaine in Europe. But if you buy it in Belgium or if you bought it in Belgium in 2018, the price that would be most frequently uh, encountered or most frequently offered to you would be 23,000 euro a kilo, which is probably cheaper than $28,000, uh, as was the price mentioned in the US. If you go to Finland, it's going to be uh, almost four times the price, right? And the lowest price reported by any country um, in Europe was $17,500 uh, a kilo by the UK while the uh, largest ever, uh, re largest reported price in 2018 for one kilo was 90,000 euros. Um, so you see, it depends where you buy, uh, where you buy the drugs. Um, uh, there is a variation in, in the price, although uh, in a country like Belgium, for example, which as you know, is a large importation hub 
for cocaine. Uh, in Europe, the price has gone down uh, uh, remarkably in the last few years. Uh, a word about the origin of the cocaine uh, found in Europe. So this is the result of a testing by the US DEA, which can profile uh, cocaine, uh, that is, determine what, where the coca used to manufacture the drugs were grown, uh, with a very high uh, level of certainty, more than 97% uh, accuracy. And according to them, um, Colombia is by far and away the largest source of the cocaine used in Europe. Um, but you can see Peru, 20%, Bolivia, 4%, and about 10% are known, um, which mirrors, in fact, the estimates of the, U, uh, the UN United Nations, sorry, um, which put Colombia uh, far ahead as a producer of cocaine, followed by Peru and then, and then uh, Bolivia. Um, the purity of this cocaine, the same cocaine that was tested by the VA, is 85% uh, uh, in the majority, a majority of the cases is ab above 85% uh, pure, uh, which means that it's quite pure. And I forgot to say that most of the samples that European countries send to the US to be tested come from wholesale shipments. So this reflects the purity of the cocaine that enters the European market. Well, that one didn't enter properly because it was seized before entering, uh, but uh, you see my point. Um, impact of COVID-19. Um, this is um, what we found in the early days of COVID-19, a comparison between uh, January and March 2020 and January and March 2018, um, you can see quite a change. I mean, a change. The almost disappearance of the container structure uh, mode of trafficking in these in this data and the emergence of Ecuador as a uh, significant uh, shipment country um, for cocaine going to Europe. Now, um, maybe the seizure in Hamburg of the 16 tons and Antwerp uh, will uh, next time make Paraguay feature prominently on this slide. Um, in fact, in 2020, uh, as a whole, in the whole year, more cocaine uh, was trafficked in container in Europe, and more cocaine, as I said, was seized in Europe than even during 2019. So uh, the impact, the impact of the COVID uh, measures on cocaine trafficking, transcontinental cocaine trafficking, seem to have been uh, very little. In fact, uh, maybe they've even helped uh, make more seizures uh, than than before. But um, still, a lot of cocaine was sent to Europe uh, during. Uh, this pandemic and, and in spite of restrictive measures. And that's it for me. I hope I didn't uh, last more than the allocated time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, another fascinating presentation. And I really think that all three presentations complemented each other uh, very uh, nicely. And as anticipated, they generated lots of questions. So we have already a very long list. I do have a few questions of my own, but I will hold back and take a a cluster of questions and, and then I'll pose them uh, I'll pose them to you. Also, a number of participants have asked about the recording and yes, we are recording this event and it will be made available on the Global Initiative YouTube channel uh, shortly. Um, so please look out for uh, for that. Uh, let me just now turn to uh, the many questions that we have uh, we have received. Um, uh, so first, I think one question that perhaps apply a, a little bit to uh, to all of you and it's really something that has been alluded to briefly and has to do with uh, with, with COVID and how COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to affect uh, the cocaine market in Europe and levels of consumption of, of cocaine in uh, uh, in Europe. I think uh, Laurent might, might want to, to take that, but others would have, I'm sure, will have view, uh, views on, uh, or, or, or on that one. Uh, also, um, you, some, some participants would like to learn more about the main criminal organizations that bring uh, cocaine uh, into Europe and whether there is a convergence with other uh, drugs that are being uh, that are being trafficked. Uh, 
I, I wonder whether maybe uh, Jeremy would like to uh, to to take uh, to take that one. Uh, and also uh, for Jeremy, uh, you you have mentioned a lot uh, Colombia is of course is a key producer uh, countries, but there are also other uh, uh, countries that are extremely productive, so uh, that have a very high production of cocaine. Uh, so would you have any uh, thoughts on uh, on that uh, as well? And um, also maybe for uh, for Fationa. Um, about there is a question about the involvement of the uh, potential or alleged uh, involvement of the uh, some Albanian officials in drug uh, in drug production, especially of cannabis. I know it's slightly off topic, but we have spoken about corruption in the course of the presentation. So is this something that you have observed uh, in the course of your research? Um, Shall we go in reverse order? So perhaps, Laurent, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, so the impact of COVID, well, as I showed on the slide, and I think it's still the case in 2021, uh, there's very little impact on wholesale market, on importation and trafficking of large quantities to Europe. Again, the uh, Hamburg affair, which we keep mentioning, uh, amply uh, demonstrates that. On distribution of cocaine to users, uh, well, yes, there might be some disruptions, uh, but I think uh, also um, there may be less people inclined uh, wanting cocaine. As Jeremy mentioned, there will be a big party after COVID. So perhaps this implies that there's less of a party during COVID um, and people may find it more difficult to find to, to buy cocaine um, um, and may be less inclined to buy because there's nothing to party about really. Um, uh, however, we don't have any uh, very precise data on this. Um, we've seen some adaptation on the part of uh, street dealers, people posing, particularly as uh, uh, food delivery services to deliver cocaine to people, um, dead drops whereby um, you agree on a place where the uh, trafficker will leave uh, an amount of cocaine that you will then go and retrieve. These type of strategies have been employed. Um, we uh, need to wait a little bit to have some data on, on use to be able to uh, strictly confirm whether or not that's being an impact on the uh, on the user market for cocaine. But for the wholesale market, I don't think there has been a, a noticeable impact, really. Thank you, Laurent. Um, Fationa? Uh, so I have to say that, uh, of course, there's some effect of COVID in, in, the, in the drug trafficking and especially when it comes to the so-called mules. So you don't have the, the passenger airlines going on as they, they did previously. Uh, so, of course, it has it has some effect. But uh, since uh, the, the majority of the cocaine entering in, in, in Europe comes with containers, this also means that uh, the transportation of goods and foods have continued. As before, so I don't really think that it has affected so much uh, the, the trafficking of cocaine from Latin America to to to, the, to Europe. Thank you. And uh, any comments on possible involvement of officials? Uh, you, you are you are you are speaking about the cannabis. The the the, the question that came from for yes. Albin. Ah, okay, uh, great. So I mean. Cannabis is not uh, disconnected by uh, by cocaine uh, uh, because uh, because of the fact that Albania has been a producing country of cannabis for three decades. It has kind of like enabled the groups in Albania to gain experience and on, on the other hand to, to be more financially strong. Uh, so they have entered because of this the lucrative market of cocaine, as I also mentioned in, in my in my presentation. Uh, and uh, and of course, cannabis is, is uh, cultivation is quite visual. So I mean, you have you have areas of, of cannabis that, that are uh, that are planted in, in the country, and I can say that for many years, like I mean, the politics and the politicians, they they kept quiet about this. This was an open secret that everybody knew, but they were not like I mean, able to 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 kind of like intervene. Uh, however, we had, I mean, in Albania, I'm based in Tirana, in fact, we had the peak of cannabis cultivation in 2016. Uh, and uh, before, the, the cannabis cultivation has been uh, 
to, to, to some kind of like remote areas, but what we have seen in 2016, it was kind of like uh, spread all over the country. And, uh, and of course, uh, that this is connected with politics, because in 2017, we had uh, electoral, like, I mean, general elections and the idea of like, I mean, let people somehow turn a blind eye to, to the cultivation is going to have the party in power in, in order to be more successful in elections. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, it was a court case against a former minister, interior minister in Albania. He was accused of facilitating, uh, but also being part of criminal group for smuggle uh, for smuggling cannabis uh, to to the to the Italian mafia. However, the the court found him uh, innocent uh, in 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 this uh, kind of like uh, uh, case. But uh, of course, uh, of course all over these years have been have been kind of like a collusion of people in power with criminals uh, because not just in Albania but I think everywhere if you don't have this corruption and if you don't have this collusion and you don't have this protection it's very difficult I mean to, 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 to traffic drugs um, so I mean this is a reality however I just want to, to also note that uh, from 2017 and until now the cultivation of cannabis in Albania is reduced a lot and this is uh, because of the internal pressure, but also from the international pressure that the country got. Uh, Fationa, since you made reference to the Ndrangheta and the relationship with the Western Balkans group, there is actually a question about that and some of the participants would like to know more about this relationship and whether uh, you see the, the Western Balkan groups are main contractors or subcon so subcontractors to the Ndrangheta. Yeah, I mean we have to to see the the geographical position of of the Balkans and and uh, and Albania. So it's just across the Italy and the collaboration between two countries are I mean, very close in terms of like every kind of collaboration, starting from businesses but also criminal collaboration. Uh, so the presence of Italian mafia, including Dracheta, in the region, uh, it has been it has been kind of like in three de decades. It's not like I mean a new kind of like uh, it's it's not a news. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, groups from the Balkans, they have, uh, they have kind of like, uh, they have kind of like uh, uh, started their criminal activity in Italy. And they have kind of like taken lessons from Ndrageta or other uh, mafia organizations in Italy. And of course, they, they learned the trick and they, they started to, to become independent after that. But of course, they saved the connections. They save the connections, and this is the reason why, uh, for example, in the in the in, in one last case, uh, where Ndrageta is, uh, members of Ndrageta were in court, so there, there were also Albania members that they, they were members of Ndrageta as well. Uh, so so the collaboration is there, and and uh, and, and and this is, is this is not new. Thank you so much, Fatiana. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment about COVID, then I'm going to pass the major criminal organizations question over to James. Um, I think there are two, two uh, factors that are worthy of note um, for COVID and, and, uh, and cocaine. One is COVID didn't affect production uh, in Colombia, Peru and Bolivia. That was almost largely uh, unchanged. Where it did hurt was in the transport from South America to Europe. And this might um, explain um, why Laurent is seeing uh, seizures go up. Um, because we were told by some underworld sources that uh, there was a significant drop in um, container shipping uh, initially, particularly during the lockdown phases in Latin America and Colombia. Um, and product was piling up in Colombia. And so what they were doing was they were putting much more cocaine into their established routes so there was more cocaine going in less uh, volume of containers which meant that the seizures that were were probably bigger than they might have been uh, under normal circumstances and that might be an explanation as to why seizures have continued to go up um, they simply had less routes to um, uh, and less containers to hide the stuff in and then i'll pass the other question to james James, please go ahead. Hi, good morning everyone, thanks. Um, yeah, I think when we're talking about the criminal groups involved in drug trafficking today, something that's very important to understand and that the, the speakers today have alluded to 
is that if you look at the entire supply chain, we're now talking about very fluid multinational networks that combine to operate for certain shipments. And then often they'll kind of disperse, go their separate ways, work with different people. Um, and to piece together this supply chain of these different groups uh, is the role of the brokers, as we've been discussing. Um, so I think you've got to break the supply chain down into its different components. So obviously you start with the supply. Uh, in Colombia, what we see mostly nowadays is the groups with the biggest influence in producing cocaine are ex-FARC dissident groups, uh, the ELN guerrillas, uh, also localised groups of, um, the, of paramilitary successor groups, things like that. So often descendants of armed groups that used to be in Colombia's conflict. In Peru, you see a very different dynamic. They're often family-based crime clans uh, that were capable of growing, producing cocaine, compiling loads. And again, they'll often work together to compile bigger orders. And then in Bolivia, again, the dynamic is very different. You've got obviously a legal coca market there and often the production that goes into cocaine production is diverted from that legal market. For the transport phase, again, what you, we see more and more is instead of thinking of these big criminal groups who do still operate, you've got the, the Gulf Clan or the Uraueños in Colombia, the PCC in Brazil, for example, um, who are still major operators with a national presence and an important role in the cocaine trade. But what we see in terms of a trend is this tendency towards smaller specialist networks. So you may have a network that is dedicated just to moving cocaine from a production zone to a dispatch point, for example. Or what we look at, especially relevant for the, for the European market, is port contamination networks. These might be specialist logistic networks, they might be street gangs that control access to the ports, uh, but they generally charge a percentage fee or a per kilo fee to get your cocaine onto a container ship. And then the other side, you'll have the, the flip side of that, you'll have specialist reception networks, who again, the buyers of this cocaine will contract them, they'll pay them a per, per, um, per kilo fee or a percentage worth of the load to remove it from the port and to bring it to a stash point. And again, I think it's also important to remember, as I think Tatjana um, referenced, that when you look at these seizures, these, these multi-ton seizures, very often we're not talking about one group um, that's moving that cocaine or one owner of that cocaine. What happens is more and more we're seeing loads compiled that belong to various different traffickers. And there'll be various different suppliers They'll all be loaded on by one dispatch network and then they'll be received the other end. They'll be taken out of the port, they'll be broken down and they'll be moved on to these various different wholesale networkers. So yes, we do still see big criminal operators with a major role in the cocaine trade, like the groups I've referenced, um, the, the, clan, the Gulf Clan, the ex-FARC dissidents, the PCC. But the trends that we're observing now is more to small, specialist networks that come together on an ad hoc basis to construct a supply chain from production zones to the reception zones and they are organized and coordinated by these brokers that we've been talking about this morning. Thank you James and a number of the things that you referenced in your remarks just now are also linked to some of the questions that we have been receiving. I'll just pick up on two on two things uh, if I may. Uh, one is on the port, port selections. How do this criminal group identify the ports they want to go to or go through? Uh, and, and the other thing, if you could tell us a bit more about the role of FARC and ELN and especially uh, their relationship potentially with the Venezuelan government and link to that their involvement into the cocaine trade from uh, Venezuela in, into Europe. Sure, okay, so I mean there are various factors that traffickers are looking for when they select a port. So I mean the easiest one, the most simple one is access to a production zone. How complicated is it to get your cocaine from a production zone to a port? In that sense the most attractive ones are the ones that are close, such as in Colombia, or in Peru. But these ports now are red flagged, especially by European authorities. They are paying particular attention to ports that are in or close to production zones. 
So that starts pushing the traffickers further afield. What else do they look for? They look for criminal infrastructure. So they look for local groups that have the, the logistical capacity to contaminate containers in these ports. Now, again, you're going to find the most sophisticated criminal networks in countries that have many, many years of experience working this. So again, Colombia uh, and Peru would be big ones, but also countries nearby. But on the flip side of this, what happens then when you've got years of, country, of uh, criminal networks working in these ports, you have years of authorities, security forces and port authorities trying to combat these groups, improving security measures, uh, carrying out investigations into who's actually doing this trafficking and trafficking gets more difficult, which is when you start to see this migration ever further afield. So what the traffickers are looking for, they're looking for a, how they can get their cocaine to the port, B, how they can then get onto the, the container shipping, and C, a level of comfort, either that the security measures aren't that good in these areas, or that the authorities are very corruptible and they don't really need to worry about the security measures because they're confident that they can get around them. So what we see, if you look at the seizures over an extended time period, you almost see them kind of fanning out from the production zones and getting ever, ever further afield as traffickers are exploring new options to minimise the risk that they're facing. Um, and with regard to uh, DLN and the FARC, um, what we're seeing, I mean, the, the ex-FARC, what we're referring to now as the ex-FARC Mafia, is not, is not the FARC. We cannot consider them to be the same thing. It's the same people in a lot of cases doing a lot of the same stuff. But now we are talking about a variety of different groups. Some of them combined to work in a kind of federation structure. Some of them are very local. Some of them are a bit more political. Some of them are completely criminalised and have lost all interest in any sense of revolution. Um, what they generally do is they work, as the FARC did, in coca producing zones. Now, in some cases, they may be producing their own coca crops, so they may be setting up growing operations. But the more common practice is for the coca farmers to grow their own coca, and then the ex FARC or, or the ALN in some cases will control access to those markets. Either they'll monopolise the, uh, the purchase of coca base or they'll control who can come in and, and purchase that base, charging a commission fee to do so. Again, they may have their own uh, cocaine processing laboratories. Often these will be linked less to the group, more of individuals within the group who have the capacity, the financial and logistical capacity to set up these, these labs. Or they may be providing security to, to these labs that are set up by specialist operators. So they provide a number of services. In some cases, they can be considered the suppliers of the cocaine, overseeing the growing of the crops, the production, the processing into cocaine and the transport. In others, they're providing more services, controlling access to markets, security to these territories and controlling the routes out of production zones. VLN are ta increasingly taking on a similar role. Uh, they have traditionally been quite far behind the FARC in their involvement in the drug trade. They were more reluctant to get involved. We are seeing, especially since the demobilisation of the FARC, uh, that the ELN as well as these ex-FARC dissident groups have stepped up. They've occupied territories that were previously controlled by the FARC and they've used that to increase their role and their access to the cocaine trade. And then um, the other side in Venezuela, um, again, what we are seeing right now in Venezuela is yes, there are very, very close ties between the state and the ELN and these ex-FARC groups. Um, we're also seeing though that the political situation is kind of mirroring this fragmentation that these good, that the, the FARC and the other criminal groups have gone on at the same time. So I think it's a misrepresentation to think of drug trafficking or state embedded drug trafficking in Venezuela to be like an organization directed from the top by Maduro and his and his cohorts. What we see is a much more decentralized system in which power is kind of managed and distributed by these senior regime figures um, and then often local 
uh, military and political actors are the ones that have a more direct relationship with the criminal groups, creating the environment for drug trafficking and either facilitating or directly participating in the trafficking operations. Thank you so much, James. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to come in on any of those? No, no, I think James has been uh, exhaustive in his cover. Let's move on to something else. Indeed, wonderful. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to take another uh, set of questions, uh, really focusing on the, uh, on the responses a bit more. There were a number of questions that uh, involved the uh, dirty money side of things and what are uh, the measures that have been implemented to basically cut the flow of, of money supplying this these criminal organizations. Uh, there's also questions <coughs> on uh, whether specialized EU agencies have had any uh, success uh, in, uh, in, 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 in stemming this increased trade in, in cocaine uh, trafficking. And, and also there is a, an issue, well, the number of questions to do with uh, with, with corruption and, and the way that uh, the cocaine trade, alongside other, you know, criminal activities, have an impact on, on governance and, and and how the corruption issue has been um, has been tackled. So, um, Laurent, would you like also to go first again? Again? Okay. <laughs> well, on the EU agencies, I thought yes, you might. Yes, the EU agencies, I should. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Well. There is an ongoing uh, response from Europe uh, on uh, various uh, sides of this uh, problem, including uh, money laundering. Uh, some money laundering networks are uh, dismantled, uh, perhaps not on a regular basis, but they are dismantled. Uh, there are uh, measures taken to uh, encourage financial operators to report uh, suspicious transactions. Uh, and this type of uh, this type of measures, um, I remember, for example, one case uh, where a, a money laundering network made up of, uh, I think, mostly Lebanese nationals, were collecting money in Europe, uh, in various countries of Europe, and uh, sending it back to La Oficina del Ligado in uh, Medellin, um, and they were taken down by, I think, a joint operation of uh, European several European police forces. Uh, and American and Colombian uh, police forces. So that's one thing against money laundering. Um, other types of responses, uh, for example, we could uh, mention the uh, Maritime Analysis and Operations Center uh, Narcotics, which is based in Lisbon, uh, not too far from the MCDDA, who is a coalition of seven European countries um, that put their intelligence uh, together and try to uh, identify the best way of uh, seizing vessels, mostly crossing the Atlantic uh, with drugs. Uh, so many other examples. Uh, to quote one which I should have uh, quoted earlier um, when I mentioned that cocaine seizures uh, increased in spite of the pandemic, is the taking down of the Anchor Chat network, which I believe is one uh, major uh, cause uh, of seizures and of arrests made by European police forces uh, in the last six months, probably. Um, AnchorChat was a communication network which was secure or thought uh, uh, to be secured by uh, mostly its users were criminals, really it was a crime as a service uh, for uh, people involved in, in crime and especially drug trafficking. Um, and, this, and they were using these phones which were specially made for them um, and uh, the system was in fact bugged by the French gendarmerie and the Dutch police, I think. And so for a number of months, the police were listening to these guys uh, explaining how they would uh, bring cocaine and other drugs, uh, methamphetamine, for example, from point A to point B, who they would use, how much they would pay, etc. And all this is documented and now they are taking these people down. Um, so these are the you know, few illustrations of what is being done in, in Europe to uh, the responses that are that are being uh, brought against cocaine trafficking. Thank you. Fatiana, what's the view from the Balkans and responses there? 
in fact, Western Balkan is like an island surrounded by all sides by European uh, Union countries. But in fact, uh, none of the six Western Balkan countries is still not part of the EU. Uh, and I think this is this is somehow a problem because although all countries are, are working with uh, Europol, uh, Interpol and all the agencies, still the kind of like uh, integration is not such as big as, as for example, is going to be if they, they are going to be EU members. So this this poses a challenge with, without any doubt. Uh, but then I think that uh, these countries are, are developing countries. Uh, and so I think it's very important for, for, for the EU and, and, and especially for countries to, to, to to kind of like provide more help when when it comes to to really going after after this sophisticated at work we can say sometimes they might might have like i mean larger budget than the states or or, or more sophistication uh, so it's really important for for these countries to get some help and i i want to emphasize that especially this help is important when it comes to the relationships of the Western Balkan countries with countries in Latin America. Uh, because I think that the EU and especially the countries that are directly uh, uh, affected by the but their but the criminal groups from Balkan outreach like Spain and and, and Dutch uh, and, and Netherlands and, and Belgium uh, can can really help in this in this regard. Uh, uh, and uh, it's important in fact to have more extradition uh, agreements uh, from the Western Balkans with the, with the Latin American countries. Uh, as I brought the, the, the example of, of the guy that was uh, running this uh, whole cocaine network from from a prison cell in Ecuador. Uh, and I think that if if um, more eff efficient agreement uh, 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 extradition agreement would have been, I mean, we are not going to have this this person in, in prison there and then still be, being very active uh, when it can uh, when when it comes to drug trafficking. So I think collaboration is key. Uh, the deepening of collaboration, and I think that the EU has to pay more attention to the to the Western Balkans support, but also uh, be a liaison in between Western Balkans and, and Latin American countries. Thank you, uh, Jeremy or James. Yeah, I'll pick that one up. Um, the United States has obviously played an outsized role in. Um, the response to drug trafficking in Latin America and the Caribbean. What we saw under the Trump administration is they very much took their eye off the ball. Uh, and indeed, one might say that um, President Trump was happy to tolerate um, leaders uh, who might have uh, shady dealings in exchange for loyalty. And I'm thinking particularly of Fernando Orlando um, Hernandez in, in Honduras. Um, President Trump, so long as the migration issue was dealt with, he was prepared to turn a blind eye to drug trafficking ac activity. Um, under President Biden, this is now changing and we're now gonna see US pressure on Honduras. We're now up on drug trafficking and we're going to see the reestablishment, I think, of, of, of US policy linked to um, a counter narcotics uh, strategy. The last thing I would say is that most of the nations in Latin America that dedicate uh, resources to the fight against drugs, and Colombia is, is the leader in this, they focus on the weakest links in the chain. So President Ivan Duque is throwing what little money he has at the coca farmers, um, who uh, make the least money um, and uh, are the most easily replaceable in the entire chain and very few governments are making the difficult decisions and following the money and looking at their own houses when it comes to corruption. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we're just going to have, and we still have this, the static bicycle of, of arrests of low-level um, uh, uh, players in the, in the drug trade, while the top-level players with the political penetration uh, and who actually control the routes are getting off scot-free. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, you, you mentioned, since you mentioned President Duque and also the uh, US administration, I have a question uh, for you as well, uh, of my own. Uh, in, in the report, you make reference to uh, the aerial spraying of coca crops, which of course is a long standing issue, uh, very, um, uh, very controversial, has been going on for many years. Do you think that giving the increase in production of cocaine Colombia eventually will have to go back to that? 
They stopped spraying in 2015 on, on health grounds. Um, the, the glyphosate chemicals were linked to, to carcinogenic uh, trends. Um, if, uh, President Duque has said he very much wants to restart it. However, due to the Supreme Court ruling that banned it in 2015, there are various different things he has to do, uh, which he's been unable to do so far. Now, the United States under Trump was pressing very hard for the re-establishment of spraying. Um, remains to be seen whether the new um, Biden administration will be quite so quite so um, interested in in pressuring for that. The issue, um, Virginia, is how effective is it going to be? Um, and we've seen this before. What will happen is it will have a short-term impact. One of the advantages from a security force and law enforcement perspective, with the end of the spring has been that drug crops have again concentrated in certain parts of the country. As soon as you start spraying, they will atomize again and spread all across um, the country as they did before, making one me meaning of violence spreads with them. Uh, and secondly, in the long term, it doesn't hit um, the overall production level. So, we are not big fans of, of, of the spraying. We don't see it as a silver bullet. Uh, and we do see it as um, leading to the strengthening of criminal actors in these different areas because it undermines the legitimacy of the state because the locals turn around and say, we get nothing from the government. And then what happens is they spray all our fields, coca and food indiscriminately, and everything is destroyed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. James, would you like to come in? Sure. I mean, I, I think I'd add one thing to the, the, the discussion on, on the policy side of it, which Jerry alluded to. Uh, but what we see very much thinking about the kind of migration of cocaine trafficking across the region is the, the real, the key to it is corruption. What cocaine trafficking networks are looking for more than anything else is the security to operate with impunity. And really to, for any security policies, public policies to be successful in combating drug trafficking, that's got to be at the top of the list to do. And it really is a top to bottom issue. You can't just focus on a few uh, port officials or police officials taking a bribe to wave a shipment through. We are looking at penetration to the highest levels of the security forces of politics and we see the same all across the um, the region so as, as jerry alluded to before i think any realistic attempt to tackle the drug trade in latin america should prioritize corruption thank you thank you very much uh, i'm very conscious that we are uh, nearing the end of our lot of time uh, we still have a number of questions i'm sure we could uh, carry on for for hours, really, and I think this is testament of the fact that uh, the report is extremely interesting and the presentations that we heard today uh, were actually great food for thought and, and really generated uh, lots of interest. Uh, I will have really unfortunately had to, to draw these to a close because we need to be uh, on time. And uh, just a reminder again that this event is recorded. So please look out for the recordings on the Global Initiative uh, YouTube channel. And also for those of you who haven't yet read the reports, please download it from either the Global Initiative or the Inside Crime uh, website. We have both English and in Spanish language translations. We hope you'll enjoy the reading and we are very uh, much looking forward to, to your to your feedback uh, on, on that. And uh, yeah, I really uh, just have to uh, thank the speakers for their for their presentations. I also thank the, the audience for joining in such a large numbers and for their uh, contribution and their questions. And, and also big thanks, a big thanks to the technical team that made this uh, this webinar possible. So it's been a pleasure to uh, to moderate the discussion and to partner up with Inside Crime on this project. Thank you again and see you at the next webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>